Now I'm pleased to introduce Sanjeet Dutta. He is a partner with King & Spalding Law Firm, and he is an attorney whose primary areas of practice are intellectual property and patent prosecution. He'll be speaking on the role of intellectual property in commercializing technology. He advises venture funds on pre-investment IP issues, including litigation risk, freedom to operate, and the strength of the company IP. Again, you can uh, uh, read his bio that is uh, that was uh, sent to you in the uh, information package. Also just wanted to remind uh, attendees that uh, um, you have received a copy of the slides in advance. If you haven't, um, please send us an email. And then again, they will be posted on the DARPA website in the fall time frame. Okay, now I'll turn the uh, webinar over to Sanjeet. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, so similar to David, I also am in Silicon Valley and uh, work with uh, many startup companies from uh, the two guys in the garage that uh, is the typical uh, story you hear about to um, you know, more uh, advanced companies in Series B, Series C, um, pre-IPO type uh, situations. But uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, should have an agenda. Hopefully we can race through some of these issues, which probably need a lot more time than we've got today, but um, we'll spend most of the time on uh, patents, a little bit of time on trade secrets, copyrights, and trademarks. Those are the four main areas of intellectual property that um, companies uh, should be thinking about and thinking about how uh, each one could best suit um, their business goals and needs and objectives. Um, so we'll also talk about when they're appropriate and then you know, save some time for Q&A at the end for, um, for any questions you might have. Next slide, please. So, you know, at a very high level, trying to differentiate the different types of IP, patents, you know, they protect how you do what you do. And that's really what the patent office is concerned about. Uh, they aren't so concerned about, you know, the benefits and how great, you know, your technology is and, you know, the uh, advances that it might make uh, over um, what's been done. But they really want to know how you do it and, you know, to the extent that the how you do it uh, achieves a better result than what's been done before, then that's kind of how it ties in. Um, but um, you know, you really want to focus on uh, the nuts and bolts of you know the technology that you developed uh, for patents, trademarks. Um, you know, as you can see in the slide, you you know use them to protect any of your names, your symbols, things that are going to identify the source of the goods or services that you provide. Um, copyrights, um, they've been in the news a lot, especially with the Google Oracle litigation that's been going on. Um, they protect various types of written artistic expression. Uh, and the big question in the Oracle Google case right now is you know, whether or not APIs can be copyrighted. And uh, Judge Alsop hasn't uh, uh, given us a decision on that quite yet. Uh, trade secrets, um, it can protect secret information that's used for commercial advantage. Uh, trade secrets are different than patents, tra trademarks, and copyrights in that there is no formal registration process uh, for a trade secret, um, but they can also be very um, uh, strong in, in when you need to enforce a trade secret and courts, even state courts, are able to um, <clears throat> help in that regard. Uh, so maybe the next slide. Uh, focusing in on patents. Um, here, you know, the right to a patent is something that's constitutional, and it's based in the Constitution, uh, Article 1, Section 8. And really what it boils down to is it's uh, an exchange where you're providing the government and you're providing uh, all of the people who um, are here, essentially, in the world to learn from your innovation such that they'll be able to then advance beyond it. And um, you know, in return, the government will give you a monopoly right, and it's uh, you know a 20-year period in which you can uh, have exclusive rights to make, use, sell, offer to sell, and import you know your own invention. Um, so, if we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, you know, there's been an awful, awful lot of debate about you know whether it's even worth patenting or not patenting, and uh, I think um, I've definitely worked with companies where they've never filed for a patent and they've become hugely successful and they've had great exits you know, through acquisitions. Uh, and then I've worked with other companies where you know, patents were very core to their overall business strategy. Um, but you know, here are five you know, good reasons why you might want to think about um, filing. Uh, one being to 
establish and let the world know, you know, what it is that you uh, believe is your intellectual property. Uh, the second one, which ties into what David and Steve were talking about, is you know, raising the valuation of your company. Um, venture capitalists and investors like uh, to see that companies do take adequate measures to protect their intellectual property, and in return for those uh, you know, efforts, you, your valuation of your company can go up, and it's often a soft um, variable that's gone and that's put into the calculus. So, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, there isn't a, a, a formulaic way of saying, oh, they have two patents, therefore we're going to value the company for an extra two million dollars or anything like that. Uh, but um, it's a it's a bit softer. And then, um, you know, to obtain patents to assert against competitors, that's definitely not something that's on the forefront of a small company or a startup company's mind. Um, but sometimes it's um, part of the licensing plans of the company downstream. And, uh, you know, that goes into the next uh, bullet, which is to have patents to license, countersuit in case you're sued by a competitor. And then, um, you know, the last bullet, a profit center for the company. Uh, you know, IBM is an example of, of that where, uh, you know, billions of dollars of revenue are generated each year for IBM based on their licensing efforts. Um, so, you know, that, uh, these bullets often uh, follow the, um, the growth of a company from um, their, their inception to, um, you know, post-IPO or, or close to a merger or acquisition. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, to patent or not to patent. Now, here's another data point for you that's pretty recent, April 9, 2012. Uh, $1.6 billion patent uh, accord with Microsoft. So Microsoft has acquired rights and more than 800 patents. You know, just doing simple math, you can see the average price is more than a million dollars per patent. So, um, you know, having patent portfolios can be something that's very lucrative, um, even years and years after they've been filed. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is getting into the nuts and bolts a little bit here. Um, you know, you want to go ahead and try to patent some technology that you have. There's a um, difference between patents, trademarks, and copyrights, where patents um, require you to make filings before there's a publication event. And if there's a publication event, um, especially with the American Invents Act and the harmonization of uh, the rules, there's an absolute novelty bar, meaning you won't be able to obtain patent rights if you've had a publication event. And so this can actually come out in a few ways. You know, for example, if you release software that embodies the invention that you want to protect, or you know, a traditional way of doing it is the professor at the university who publishes uh, his findings in a journal. Um, sometimes you can make presentations. You know, this is something that's a pitfall for a lot of startup companies, where you uh, talk to um, you know, third parties about uh, your technology that you're without having them sign an NDA. Um, you know, press releases, magazine articles, demonstrations, and even more recently, we're seeing issues with blogs. Uh, so those are all ways that um, you know you could get in trouble and uh, shoot yourself in the foot when it comes to patent protection. And the last bullet there, an offer for sale. Um, so that can also trigger a one-year clock that ticks. Uh, which you have to file in the U.S. And then, as I said, with the American Events Act, that's changing, so it will become an absolute bar. Um, so moving on to the next slide. A good way to start process is with provisional patents. Uh, many of my clients take advantage of this because it's a relatively low-cost way of getting your foot in the door, and it preserves your rights not only in the United States, but also in all you know, foreign jurisdictions. So um, you know, the provisional patent um, could be a really good way for you to start the patent process for your company. But, um, you know, these last bullets on this slide um, are sort of the high-level things that you want to be thinking about to frame, you know, what it is that you want to file on. And, um, you know, to meet the statutory requirements, um, it's got to be novel, um, it must be useful, and then lastly, not obvious to a person with expertise in the field of the invention. So, you know, the second prong is pretty straightforward. I think most folks feel like uh, they can put their thumb on whether or not what they want to protect is useful. But the first and the last prongs are things that are actually determined over the course of prosecution with the Patent Office. And uh, we'll 
we'll be able to get into that in, in a little bit. Uh, next slide. Different types of examples of the patents. You know, back in the day, someone filed a patent on a toupee. Uh, next slide. And uh, there's been some crazy ones that have made it into the press. A method of swinging on a swing. Um, never been enforced. I think it was mainly to uh, to uh, prove a point. And I go on to the next slide. And then we get into things that are more like um, you know what we're probably more used to seeing. Uh, first one having to do with uh, semiconductors for um, for logic devices, uh, second one for an online trading environment. And I think there's people online um, who are in the semiconductor space and also have uh, experience in optics. Um, you know, those are all areas that are ripe for, for patent protection. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, well, you know, there's already a patent on this or there's a patent on that. Uh, you know, what I wanted to make a point of is that improvements are typically what patents reflect. Um, you know, there's always going to be some technology that you're leveraging to be able to do what uh, you're doing. And just because of the fact that there, there, there is a leveraging going on, that doesn't mean that you won't be able to get a patent on the particular way that you're doing something, especially if it's better than what it's been done in the past. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we often get questions about business method patents and whether or not they're and whether or not software is patentable. Um, the uh, Bilski decision uh, from 2010, which is a Supreme Court uh, case, is something that has gotten a lot of uh, discussion. Um, if you go to the next slide, you know, let's get into a little bit of the details here. But um, you know, the, the punchline is, is that yes, you can patent software. Yes, you can patent business methods. But the you know, practitioner's note here is to make sure that when you're doing it, you're doing it in the context of you know, the, the computer systems or the, um, you know, the physical embodiments of what it is that it, it allows you to um, offer that business method, you know, whether it's servers and clients or, um, you know, and if it's software, again, it, it's often in the server co client context these days with web-based technologies. And so, you know, if anyone is going to be replicating what you're doing, they're going to be using those types of computer devices to develop their uh, products as well. Uh, next slide, please. And often my clients ask me, what, what should I try to be protecting with patents? And, you know, these are the questions I think you'd want to be asking yourself. And hopefully it'll help you hone in on, you know, the things that you should be spending your limited resources on. And, um, you know, it really does depend on your business and, you know, things to consider is, you know, what differentiates you from your, your competitors? Um, those are the things that they might want to copy. And so, you know, perhaps it would be best to try to focus your energies on those types of things. And it'll also allow you to detect whether or not your competitor is infringing your patent, you know, more easily rather than something that might be happening in the back end that no one has any visibility to. And then the other thing to con consider is, you know, how long would the technology be valuable to the company? And so to the extent it's foundational, you know, um, it's probably something that the company is going to be built upon. And, um, you know, years of the company's success will depend on having a strong foundation in the uh, patent portfolio. Next slide, please. Government rights. Um, so the DARPA-funded companies um, have the ability to uh, retain ownership of their patents. Um, and for the most part, uh, I've worked with a, a number of companies that have taken DOE funding, um, and uh, they've had great success over the years uh, as they continue to grow. One, one company is in the geothermal space and um, you know, got started about four or five years ago, and um, you know, their patent portfolio has a large number of provisional patents that have been converted into utility applications. And now they've actually had at least a, a half a dozen or so uh, notices of allowance, allowances and issue as patents. And in each of those situations, uh, you know, they follow the processes that are laid out um, for, you know, accepting the funding. And typically what, um, you know, it comes down to is providing notice to uh, the government about um, the technology and the folks are able to then um, make a determination as to whether or not they want to retain any rights. Um, can you go on to the next slide please? 
and you know, these go into some of the details Sanji? and um, you know, Excuse me, yes. Sanji. Yeah, I just wanted to break in. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so I'd appreciate if you could um, just, you know, wrap up on the um, on the government rights, and then specifically, I'd like you to address uh, the cost, and then uh, also, uh, you know, get to your uh, last slide, which is uh, recommendations. And then people will have the charts, and uh, they can get Fantastic. the information on the trademark. So, really appreciate appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, that sounds great to me. And um, yeah, essentially, um, especially if you're a small business entity, uh, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, there might only be a simple statement that goes into the beginning of the patent application that uh, you know, the technology described in there was used by a government grant. And um, the government at, one, at any point uh, later could potentially use the technology but, and, and retain a license to it, but the uh, company would still maintain ownership. Um, and so let's go on to the next slide and probably move through these really quickly. Uh, this is information specific for small businesses, so you know, feel free to, to dig into that. And if you have questions afterwards, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I can try to go into more detail on that. Uh, next slide. More detailed information. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. All right, I think we'll go ahead and yes, get um, into costs. Um, I'm not sure. Here we go. Uh, these are um, filing fees for provisionals, non-provisionals, and then the attorney time. You know, 30 to 40 hours on preparing a non-provisional application is, um, you know, for a moderate uh, complexity technology area. Uh, you know, pretty much an average, and um, you know, for provisionals, the nice thing about it is it really has no format, so the cost can be very low. Uh, the technology needs to be described in a way that someone else would be able to understand what you're talking about, has a similar background as the engineer. And uh, because of that, as an attorney, we can leverage all of that information from you and keep the cost really low. So here, at least um, in the last uh, seven years, we haven't had a provisional cost more than $2,000 all in. And then with uh, non-provisionals, they're usually running around $10,000 to uh, $12,500 for computer-related technology areas. Um, so the uh, PCT applications are the best option for foreign filing, especially if you're going to be looking at protecting your invention in three or more countries. Um, but uh, you have to be careful there because the costs do grow exponentially as you add a country, uh, add each additional country. Um, and let's go ahead to the last slide. So, so with these recommendations, uh, you know, patents, you definitely want to keep notebooks. Um, work closely with your outside counsel to work on a strategy that's um, thoughtful and mindful for, for your particular company and your needs. Um, budgets are some things that can get out of control. Uh, out of, uh, good IP counsel isn't necessarily inexpensive, uh, so you want to be careful about that. And, um, you know, the new rules with the American Events Act are definitely creating a few pitfalls here and there that you want to be aware of. Uh, the last uh, bullet there on patents is really important. Uh, with absolute novelty requirements around the world and the harmonization of patent laws with the American Events Act, um, you know, disclosure event could be catastrophic and, um, and um, you know, there was a, a, a lawsuit against Facebook recently where they essentially uh, were found to infringe the patent, but then the jury found that the patent was unenforceable because the company had actually uh, offered the technology for sale, um, you know, blowing the uh, novelty requirement. And so, um, you know, that didn't occur until, you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars were spent litigating the patents. And, uh, you know, it was uh, a very unfortunate uh, event for the company that, uh, you know, was trying to enforce the patent. Um, and with that, you know, I think I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over for, for Q&A. Thank you, Sanji. Appreciate uh, all your comments. Um, just, you know, one quick question. Um, in terms of um, licensing, if you're interested in a licensing deal, how important is it uh, to uh, patent your technology? Um, you know, with, with my experience, the, the largest uh, licensors that are in the news are companies that have patented um, you know, technologies uh, since the beginning of, of, of their, their days. And um, the reason I think it, it is really important to have patents for licensing is that it establishes what it is that you truly own and the 
claims of the patent actually give some understanding as to the, the meets and bounds of what it is that you um, have that monopoly right over. And so, um, you know, those types of licenses on patents tend to uh, generate more revenue for companies than, um, let's say, a, a general software license um, or any other type of license on know-how. And, and most of the licenses that I see will wrap um, a lot of those things together where there might be a software component, patent rights component, and a know-how component as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if we didn't get to any of your uh, questions, we will uh, get back to you later with some answers. So appreciate everybody's uh, patience. And uh, now I'd like to um, uh, introduce the next briefer.